Hello, I'm Mally Schantzfeld, Managing Editor of Orthodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a continuing education presentation and question and answer with Dr. Mike Reagan. In our webinar today, we'll be discussing processes to enhance the quality of patient care and optimize clinical efficiency. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question and answer feature in the control panel on your screen to ask any questions, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session as time permits. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today. Dr. Mike Reagan operates a private practice in Dallas, Texas. He's a member of a number of professional associations, including Baylor's Odontological Honor Society, the American Association of Orthodontists, and the Southwestern Society of Orthodontists. In 1997, Dr. Reagan graduated with honors from the Baylor College of Dentistry in Waco, Texas. He received his postgraduate training in orthodontics from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Reagan is a guest lecturer and past alumni president at Nova. Dr. Reagan, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate that. Okay, let's start with this. I always start with uh, two truths and a lie, just for people to get, get to know me a little bit better, kind of break the ice, get it started. So two of these statements are true and one's a lie. And the first statement is I was drafted to play professional baseball by the Cubs. Second is leading scorer in lacrosse in the state of Texas as a senior. And number three, I could, and that being in the past, could dunk a basketball. So what do you think are the false things? Well, if you picked baseball, then you are incorrect because I was actually drafted by the Cubs to play professional baseball at a high school and up going to Baylor. My dad had played uh, collegiate baseball and said, you're not going unless you're deaf, drafted in the top five rounds and 87th round is not the top five rounds. So that one is actually true. The second one that is true is dunking the basketball. My best friend, six foot nine in high school could dunk kind of teased me about it and said, you'll never do it. So I bought these things and it increased my vertical and my uh, speed uh, significantly. So at one point I could, there was no such thing as lacrosse in the state of Texas at the time. So let's get going here. got to give a shout out to my world champion, Texas Rangers, about to start baseball season again. Uh, so looking forward to it. All right. So uh, as you heard from Mally, some of the things I'm a, a part of, Southwest, I'm past president, AO. I've been on COC, and I'm currently a delegate again uh, for the Southwest Society. And then I serve a couple other roles, um, one as the head of orthodontics for MCNA Dental, and then the other, of course, as husband and father. And that's my most important. So this is my family when they were young. And here we are now. We love traveling. So this is in Prague. That's Prague in the background. And then we love to go to New York, especially during the holidays. So I graduated from Baylor University in Waco, um, and that's where I played baseball as well. And I was lucky enough to have my daughter follow me there. She's a senior studying speech pathology, and we'll be going to graduate school next year. And this is where the lacrosse thing comes from. This is my youngest. This is Caroline playing lacrosse and field hockey. And she actually currently plays at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania studying psychology. But she plays both field hockey and lacrosse. And we're, of course, the proud Texans up in Pennsylvania. So she had to take that photo. And then I went uh, after there, went to Baylor College of Dentistry, graduated there, went to Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and have been in private practice ever since. So you're going to see this in my presentation. This is Dr. Luis Carrier, if you guys have never met him. Uh, super influential in the way that I correct bites. And one of the things that saved me a lot of time using DM is the motion appliance. So quick thank yous to Dr. Scott Reynolds, my good buddy from ortho school who got me into this. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time. Jason and Miko Jennings, that's my DM coordinator and my DM rep, uh, which are, yes, they're married. They've helped me so much. My staff are going all in with me. Holly Wilson, my DM trainer, helped me so much in, in integrating and uh, the DM Summit, which is where I really got started with this. Uh, thanks to Celine for, for bringing my board to go to this. It was great. The next summit, I believe, happens next year. would be a great thing to go to. So what was the role of DM in my practice? So I was going through the staffing issue when I started this and still kind of am, as many of you are throughout the U.S. And so I thought I needed more staff to run DM, and I was completely wrong. And so... Um, it actually turns out I needed one less staff member than I thought. 
I intended to need. The dynamic scheduling has changed the way we schedule things. I'm going to hit on these a little bit as we go through the presentation as we uh, as it goes along here. Um, and it, it actually changed the way that we were scheduling from scheduling from norms in research to true biologic scheduling. The stress of my life has decreased significantly. As I said, I love to travel. And with traveling so much, um, this is easy to take with, on travel with us to, um, to uh, get this, uh, uh, to be able to use this tool while I'm traveling and still see patients. And then the tech office, we're really high tech in our office. You're trying to integrate all technology as much as possible. So one of the benefits of treating your patients with DM, um, and, and, and that's the way we do it with goals, and we do it for every type of patients, from RPE to motion, braces, aligners, everything. So it's helped us in so many ways. Decrease the staff need, which we talked about. Uh, better tracking of treatment, we call it weekly house calls. This is how we market it to our parents and patients to let them know that we're able to see things much more um, on a much more regular basis. Better communication with patients using the chat feature. And it's also a permanent record, so we have it on file for the future. Catching issues before they become a problem. Um, patient discomfort, hygiene, emergencies, all of those. And then the dynamic scheduling, which has definitely decreased the number of visits. Um, it's such a visit. It makes each visit so much more powerful and purposeful. Um, it's open the schedule up so that we can see emergencies or anything we need. Last minute person coming in. Same day starts, it's opened up that to us, and the using of biologic norms, which are super important and helpful. So let's get into this and see how this feature works. So what are goals? They're your treatment objectives or milestones. And so this is what it looks like um, on, the, um, on the DM platform. If you look at it on the screen, it's on the bottom left. That's where your goals sit. And then with each goal, um, it's easy to track because uh, as you see the dots on the right-hand side of your screen, each one of them has a purpose. So gray means we're not tracking. Blue means it's being tracked but hasn't achieved yet. Green means we've achieved our goal. And red is telling us that it's overdue. So super easy visual for yourself or your DM coordinator. And when we're setting the goals for each patient, each one of them has their own pull down. As you can see on the left, you just click on the play button. That will bring, bring down the triggers to associate the, the, the weeks before and after. And then on the far right, you see, you can set that goal to any interval that you want. I'll talk a little bit about what intervals I use as we go through this. So goal optimizations and timing is the question. And what I mean by that is, how do you set your goal intervals? So I think there's actually three ways to do this. Short intervals, you set the goal to shorter to make it uh, show more notifications for checking it. You set longer goals closer to your two treatment times that you've already been doing in your practice. And third would be to set no treatment goals and rely on DM to do it or your, or your DM coordinator to do it. And I think that there's a definite choice here. So you shouldn't do the short intervals. Um, it's going to give you so many notifications. It just doesn't make sense to do that. And then no goals doesn't work. What you really want to do is set it based off of what you're already doing in your office. And this keeps treatment moving. Um, if things are done sooner, it helps you understand that. If things need to go a little bit longer, it helps there too. So in DM, um, it's not just goals. There's a hierarchy of things that we use here. So protocols and plans is what you set and put together so that it puts in place for each type of treatment what you're tracking and how you're tracking it. And under that are the goals um, and evaluate and track those notifications. And under goals, you have team instructions and communication. Under team instructions, what you have are your goal intervals, which we discussed er earlier, your review interval. And what I mean by that is somebody taking a look at it and when your next visit needs to happen. Under communications, we're talking about the chat feature, quick responses that are really, really helpful in your practice. If you're not using them currently and you're using DM, you really need to get on this. And these are not only for doing a response now, but you can schedule them. And we'll talk about that. So who makes the selections for each of these things? So your protocols and treatment plans, your clinical staff will do this at the start visit. So you're selecting the protocol that goes along with the treatment you're doing. Say it's RPE, we have an RPE protocol. Say it's a motion, we have a motion protocol. And that's all set up in the system. 
And then your DM coordinator is checking it and, and our DM coordinator has access to our, our schedule and can look and see if it was a start, is this in the right protocol? And then goals. Clinical staff sets this at each visit. So this is part of the learning curve uh, when you get started with this. And it's an ongoing thing that we talk about during our staff meetings to keep us on track to make sure we're doing it. Always the DMC has the opportunity to change it with doctor input or if they notice that it's not right. And then team instructions or chats are used by everybody in the office from me to the DM coordinators to the individual team members, front desk and in your clinical staff. So what are the expected intervals? And, and what I mean by that is how are you going to set this up in DM? And I do it based off of how I used to do my scheduling in my office anyway. So initial arch wires, we'd see it eight to 10 weeks. Arch wire changes and reposts, six to eight weeks. And so you add these different things that you already do in your practice, and you're not going to make a big change to them. You're going to keep on that same interval. So I suggest for you to do the same thing. Whatever intervals you are normally scheduling for, we'll use those to set our goal intervals and that way you keep your staff, it's easier to transition, you keep them on track, you keep things going down the road the way that it should. So in the selections, what you need to think about is select the fewer number of goals that can accurately, accurately predict the movement. And do not select goals with little chance of being met. And the problem is, as a, if they're irrelevant, you, you, you're selecting more than you need, and it makes it harder for your staff to keep up with, especially their DMC. So select the specific goals, and I'm going to talk about that as we go through through some clinical cases that are really kind of highlight how we do it in our office. So tracking these through notifications, and what are notifications? And you see them on multiple places on this on this screen. So use the pointer up here on the top left, and you can see. Right above your goals, there's a notification section, and it shows you what to review. And this is where my DMC takes this, uses this, and this is how she at, she sends information to me to let me to let me know uh, that there's something to review. Um, you can see down below in the goals, there's slight there's notifications under as you see here. This hasn't been met, and it tells you how much it's overdue. And then underneath uh, at here with each patient, it shows you the goal intervals down here at the bottom, and the goals that are overdue. So very easy to track these notifications as you go through the process. So let's look at a few cases here. So the first one is an RPE and phase one case. And this young lady, uh, actually a neighbor of mine, lives down the street. Uh, we can see that there is a bilateral posterior crossbite showing up more on the left than the right, which is very common, of course, because of the functional shift for having her bite here in CO, so you don't see it as much. You truly see the bilateral component to it. And also, not a lot of space for those upper lateral incisors. So here's how we set the goals. Goals for number one, the RPE treatment, we're going to set cross bite on the left. Because of that functional shift, that's the place it's going to look for that cross bite correction. When we get into our two by four treatment with coils, we're going to use the passive arch wire and space closure. So on the right hand side of the screen here, what you see is the scheduling and, communica and communications that we've set up for this. And in the past, this is how we would do it one turn every other day for a month. And then um, it would come down uh, and we would check it at that month. And then we would stop turning and we'd see it for a month and wait for to bond. And then you would expect that this would be three to four visits, 15 to 30 minutes each visit. Well, now here's what we do. We one turn every other day, tell them not to stop. Our DM coordinator is checking it every two weeks inside DM using quick responses and the next visit as bonding. So we've saved all those visits for those quick checks that now we can see in DM. So in this case, what you see here is um, that cross bite here on the upper left. The goals that are being set up here, you can see we go down here, cross bite left, we've set our interval for two to 12 weeks. We expect that we're going to turn the expander for three to four months. So what we do is we set that interval at that four month interval, and that's 12 weeks. Um, I'm sorry, at three months, which is 12 weeks, because I go the shorter of the interval to set this. So we have some pro tips here. And what I mean by that is, these are things that we do on a regular basis to make it better. So what you're doing is determine your interval that you want your DMC 
or your doctor to look at. We call this eyes on. So this has nothing to do with the goal specifically, has everything to do with we want to check. And so if it guns, it's done faster than that interval, we might catch it even before it shows the cross bite correction. And so what we do with an RPE is we have an interval of two weeks. My DMC is checking it. And it's not only to check to see if it's done turning, it's trying to keep ahead of some of the problems that, um, that can develop during this, which I'll talk about here in just a second. And then the next pro tip is don't set up your next visit in your um, schedule as check appliance, like we've done for so long. Set it up as next visit to bond. So you're doing home house calls to check on this every two weeks, quick, easy, fast, no chair time, next visit would be bonding. But it also catches problems. And what's the one of the number one problems that we see and the reason we bring patients in quickly after we put this in is that parents sometimes don't turn the expander the right way. They're either turning it and turning it back, or what if we have a bad screw that's turning itself backwards? So you can see here, this is an early expansion screw, very little space, but we can see that it's turning properly because look at the opening, not only the bite change, but look at the opening in the screw itself. So avoiding issues are things that DM do very well. And here's the next one. If you look down here, it shows you that there's mucosal irritation or embedding of the appliance. If you look on the right, you'll see that these are in good shape. They're not in the tissue. So let's blow up this left um, photo so you can see it even closer. And if you look, you can see that this is indeed embedded in the tissue. This could become an infection in the future. And this one's even starting to get it. So by bringing them in soon, doing this little quick adjustment, five minute adjustment, you can avoid bigger, better problems for the future. So quick responses and communication. So with that tissue issue, we have this that we've set up that's a quick response. We can just go in and quickly click it, click it, sorry, and send that in. And this one just says, hey, looks like it's in your gums. Please give us a call. But we also have the one for, hey, looks like there's some slow prog progress. How is it turning? Anything we can help you with? And these are super helpful and quick responding by your DM coordinator to do this. How about really quick, easy responses to them to encourage them and tell them, hey, you're doing a great job. So they don't think that you're just ignoring or avoiding them by sending them away for so many intervals. That's the problem. Many people worry about putting people on dynamic scheduling because they're going to think the patient thinks we forgot them. Well, these are quick and easy to use to send to the patient to say, hey, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Once we get to the arch wire stage, um, then we switch to passive arch wires, as I had said in that first slide. So this, we've set it up. Um, no, we haven't hit it yet because we set our interval at that interval. It's a longer interval. But you can see in this case, we're slowly developing the space. And as we are, the eruption of this tooth is happening, but over here, the eruption is not. So this is something we're going to use to keep and track this. We can see that it's actually a passive arch wire with six weeks left. So we're ahead of schedule, and that's great. But now we still are not going to bring them back in until we can see some signs of that erupting tooth. And so on the left here, you see the tooth isn't in. On the right, we can see it's in, but it's still not quite time to bring them in. If I brought them in here, we couldn't do anything anyway. So why not wait, not have multiple visits to do it, have the one visit to make it go in the future. So this is super helpful to try and prevent some of those effects or problems that if you're not looking for them, um, they'll drag your schedule out for these little individual visits that you really can't do anything for. So it's a Big time saving. The other thing you can do is if you're watching, say you're waiting for a primary tooth to, to exfoliate, you can actually put that as one of your goals to follow that as well. So in this case, we're 10 months of treatment. I've only seen her three times, cementing the RPE, direct bonding the two by four, and then one arch wire change. And now we're waiting for eruption. If I had been seeing her more often, this would probably be four or five visits. So we've saved somewhere in the three to five visit range with the RPE monitoring, one to three visits with the eruption of the tooth. Tons of saving, opening up your schedule so that you don't have to worry about all that clutter and non-productive non visits. These are all productive visits that we do for these patients. Well, let's talk about motion in phase one. So this kid, what you're gonna see is 
blocked out upper lateral incisors, as you see up here in this top, top picture, and then some crowding on the lower. He's class two on each side, so we're going to do motion on both sides, and um, you can set canine on the left, canine on the right to class one, and if you want to, you can set the molars when we get into two by four. We will set the passive arch wire goals, goals to close the space. So in the old scheduling system, two weeks to check for bears, four weeks for rams, and then four to six weeks for Impala or Force One to be seen in the office. And now we give them all the bands. We don't schedule the next visit. The DM coordinator is checking the progress every two weeks or so. And then we use quick responses that are designed to tell them when to shift, to switch, when not to switch and what not to switch to. And then the next visit is the bonding visit. So you can see here, what we're doing is the canine, uh, canine class one, we're setting that trigger and that um, we said we normally see three to four months before the motion has finished itself. So we set it at the three month interval, setting it right in on track. So asymmetric motion cases is a pro tip for motion. We always put it on both sides because how many times have you seen that class two case that you only put it on one side, the class two side is correcting and the other side drops class two. So we're trying to keep ahead of that. And then we talked about tracking the canine and the molar, especially in your phase ones, it's much more efficient to just track the canines. Molar is sometimes hard to see. Those smaller mouths and, you know, depending on the tube size you can get in there, sometimes you can't get a great lateral shot of the molar itself. So, so just sticking with the canines for now. And so you see we have this goal set at 12 weeks right here. And we're watching it fixed now. You can see this side is overcorrecting and looking good. So we send out the first message, and that first message is, hey, um, the rubber band order is bears to rams, and finally Impala. Please wear bears for two weeks. Don't change to the rams. That's an important statement. Please do not change to the Impalas until you're told. A lot of people will change ahead of their time. Some people won't change on a good interval. So this is our first message, and this is all automated or quick responses. And, and so what we've done is we've automated them at the two-week visit and the four-week visit because we're going to tell them to go ahead and switch at two weeks. And the reason we do the two-week visit is we call it training wheels. And what I mean by that is light force, keeping them going so they don't stop uh, because of discomfort. And then we get to our, our correction stage. So we've gone through. They've been in rams now. We've been following it every two weeks. And we can see the left side is corrected and the right side is not quite yet. So... We ask them the question, and this is a quick response. Hey, how's it going? Score yourself on a scale of one to 10. And then if they're doing well and we see that it's time to switch, okay, great. We just send this message. The third message says, hey, it's time to switch to Impalas for approximately four to six weeks. Please keep scanning, and this will avoid delays. So we can see this is that overcorrected side I'd showed earlier, but this side is still just end on. So we have another quick response that we've developed, and that is to let them know that they can switch the bands. And, and what we're going to do is wear the right side full time and the left side just at night. And so this is an easy response to them. They do it. You can see that now we're corrected into a class one relationship on that side. So see the space that's developed now here in the front. And you can see it started here. Go over here and you can see the spacing that we've developed anteriorly. And so now we're ready to move on to the bracket stage. So at this stage, we actually put the brackets on. In this case, we're using Wild Smiles. Those are the uh, home plate or Superman logo Wild Smiles braces. We've got this um, uh, coil to develop the space. You can already see the tooth coming in slightly here and then even more so here as we progress. One of the good things that it's doing here is you can see it's tracking the passive arch wire. So we know that. It's also noticing plaque and food debris, pointing that out. You can see that up here. And then as we see here, it says the goal is achieved. And as we note that, I'm also looking at this, which is telling us what the bite relationship is. So in the molar, it's still a little bit class two, but we're developing our space over here. And on the left, we know we were overcorrected class one to class three. So seven months total in treatment at this point, three total visits so far, two to get the motion started, one to bond the braces. Next visit, we're waiting for eruption, so we're not going to see them until that is ready to go. So it saved us all of these visits. So by doing this with this dynamic scheduling, 
I like to call it softening the schedule. What I mean by that is you're still going to have to see your normal patients at normal intervals, but it softens it by not seeing all of these quick checks for RPEs, motion checks that we don't need to see that we can see in person in so much better detail in um, MDM. And so you have to take in the burden off of yourself and your staff. So what about motion and full braces? In this case, we're going to see that they had had phase one before. You can see a little um, uh, bonded wire. And so they moved to tell them to us. And so what we decided to do is motion on both sides. Again, setting canine goals. That's, that's the first one. And then molar goals, if you desire. Once we get into braces, we'll set the pat arch of path off. I'm sorry, we'll set the passive arch wires, upper and lower, and the overbite. And finally, with elastics to finish, we'll set overjet and canine left and right if we need it. In the past, we already know the motion, how much we would see them. But now what we do is we send them with all the bands like we talked about before, the quick responses, using those so that we don't have to send there. Our DM coordinator doesn't have to add everything. The quick responses are ready to go. Um, next visit is bonding and then on-demand arch wires using biology, not norms from research because everybody is different. So in this case, quick pro tip, we bond our motion to that high canine so it extrudes it as it distalizes. And then you set your goals with the end in mind always. We've talked about that a little bit before, but what I mean by that is, so you're trying to get the canine and the molar into class one. And so you want to set that goal in a realistic time frame to meet that. And so in this case, we're going to set it that three month mark. We said three to four months is what we expect. And then remember, if you can get a good scan of the molar, leave that in it. If not, then only put your canines as a goal to follow. So you see here, we're setting that goal in that two to 12 week interval like we've done before. Setting both sides. And then... Um, don't set the overjet because think about this with motion and mini bike correctors. They distalize well on the top. Edgar does, Herps does, but you may not set your overjet until you retract those upper anterior. So overjet is not a great thing to use with motion to track. So quick responses, where do we see those? So just so you know, of course you've got the little chat feature right here. And so I blew it up to show you, it's right here at the top, but it looks just like this. So here they all are. We've got these all set up. You see this down here on the bottom using quick responses, quick replies. You click on that. It brings up your list. You choose the one that you want. So we've already talked about this, but these are our quick responses for full treatment cases. And this is, this is the, you have to use the new action button, which is right here. And that is where you schedule your messaging. So these are the ones we've scheduled. You can put whichever one in there from your quick, quick replies. You can see it here, are quick responses. And you set your date that you want that to go out and the time that you want it to go out. So now you don't have to worry about your DM coordinator sending it out at that two week interval or that six week interval. It's all set and ready to go. So visual cues, of course, we can see it visually in the photos, but you can also see it in the um, descriptions here. You see the um, molar relationship right and left. So in this case, you can see it's class two. If you go over here now, it's starting to show that. The left side is class one, which you can see above, and the right side is still showing class two. And then now as we progress, now you're seeing it go from class one to class three. Remember, overcorrection is key with most bike corrections, not any different with the motion appliance. So we can see that the left side canine is overcorrected to a class three, love it, and the right side is not quite yet. So then we would send that next message, or you can send the message to where right full-time left at night or left full-time right at night based off of what is needed. So these are all of those quick responses we described before. When we transition, we keep the motion in place and transition to brackets. So now we have a different protocol set up for that. And you can see on the bottom left, we've set our passive ar archwire goals. But one of the things that can catch, and this happened all at the same time and an injury while she was out of town skiing, is that both the motions were knocked off. And you can see this alert telling us that there's damage to the appliances. They've been debonded. Now, if you debond them, you have to make sure that you are making that note um, on, to exclude those teeth so that you don't uh, keep sending notifications that don't need to be sent. So this case is nine months total treatment, three visits, two to start the motion, one to bond, 
And so we've saved all these extra visits. But the key here is dynamic scheduling and these communication tools. Auto responses for the motion, and then also hygiene, RPE turning, retainer instructions are all there ready to send out as you watch your cases develop. So what are the common problems with the motion or bracket errors? So here is one of the things that we see with motion that DM has helped us keep track of so we don't miss it. And so the first thing that we see here is that on the right side, as we've corrected and went into brackets and we start to retract our upper anteriors, it went from a class three to a class one, which is fine. So this is part of the reason that we overcorrect, but we also wanna make sure this doesn't slip past that class one as it has here to more class two. And you can even see the cuspid shows class two. Sure enough, we've lost some of our anchorage. What this tells me is that number one, we either didn't overcorrect enough or, excuse me, my staff uh, didn't keep them wearing the rubber bands or they're not wearing the rubber bands like they're supposed to. Because typically when we're tracking the upper anterior, we keep them in nighttime elastics. So make sure that we overcorrect is the number one thing. And number two, to make sure that they continue to wear their elastics as you go through this um, protocol. So, um, so the next case we're gonna show you are motion and aligners. Because a lot of people are talking about Aligner cases with DM being super helpful, I agree 100%, but using motion ahead of aligners and sometimes, in this case, we're going to use motion and simultaneous aligner movement to maximize our movement. So here we are with this young lady. She came in and she's actually class three. Um, really, it's more crowding on the lower. You see that retrocline lower anterior. And so to try and avoid doing lots of IPR, we decided to put her into the motion. So we'll set our canine relationship to class one, molar maybe not. And the aligners, there's really no goals to set because the aligner protocols that DM have in place already have this ready to go. So again, we talked about this with the motion. We've saved all these visits. We still send them with all the bands. The great thing is that you're tracking the aligner at the same time you're tracking the motion, the aligner on the upper is doing movements. So we're getting ahead of the crowding on the upper and the lower motion is actually helping us getting ahead to get ahead of the crowding on the lower before we get into aligners, again, minimizing that IPR. So this case, um, we're tracking the canine to go not only to class one, but super class one. And so you see our, our end on class two, I'm sorry, because you see on the left side of the screen right here, this is class one and this is super class one or slightly class three. So we're using motion with uh, a liner simultane simultaneously. You don't have to do anything different. You just follow your motion aligner protocols. And that's what this is talking about. So you might wear your elastics um, to your motion or to your aligner in the future to try and prevent that change from happening. But this is all super easily done with, with the DM protocols following the motion and the aligner. So in this case, you can see we got to aligner eight. And what this is showing us on the timeline, we were, we were good. We had this time in four that we had to stay in for a little extra time. But this time in eight, what this is showing me is that we're getting no-goes. And what I mean by that is the DM system sets them up to change their liners if it sees that there's no spacing on an interval that you suggested, either a timing interval or, in this case, the amount of unseating of the trays. So we've had this unseating of the tray on number eight for a long time. They stayed in it. So we're just increasing our treatment time, but we don't have to bring them in. We can see this. We can send them some quick replies talk, telling them to use Chewies or telling them to make sure that they're wearing their liners or asking them to score themselves so we don't burn time. Then we transition all the way to aligners. So aligner goals, there's lots of things you can set or not based off of your desired treatment. So if overbite is deep and you're trying to fix it, set your overbite um, and your goals. If you're trying to still either correct overjet or make sure that your overjet stays at class one and you're wearing elastics to the aligners, set your canines. Remember, stop seeing your patients every so often you don't need to. 
this is going to track it for you. If things get off track, that's when to see them. So eyes on through your DM coordinator or yourself, you set an interval for that. In my case, my interval to see it is every four weeks. I just want to check it and track it. If it's getting off track, my DM coordinator will send it to me. So I don't have to see them in the office until I know something is going wrong or we need to do a refinement. Some things coming up in the future with dental monitoring with some using 3D monitoring and STLs are going to help this even more so in the future. So watch for that to come. So, so far we're 18 months into treatment. Now this is a teenager in high school. We know how that goes sometimes with wearing aligners. So we have gone 18 months. If you think about these cases that haven't been as cooperative with aligners in the past, you've spent a ton of time waiting for this to happen. So it's gone 18 months, but I've only seen her four total times. And so I did the two for the initial visit to get the motion started, one for refinement and one visit to deliver the refinement, uh, to deliver those liners. And then one more visit here that I did because we started a second refinement. So not, not many combinations, not doing these combination treatments. Um, you can do this without having them come in so often into your practice. That's softening that schedule again. It's actually two in these cases that aren't being so cooperative. Why keep seeing them in? You can do most of your motivation over either the chat feature or your quick responses. And if need be, have a phone call. Don't bring them in. Don't burn that chair time. So braces cases. Um, Goals and, are, and the advantages of using. So your goals are set up. So your dynamic scheduling and your ability to use biology and not treat to norms. And what I mean by that, and, and I've seen this in my cases, I'm seeing about a third of my cases finish faster than I expected with their arch wire movements. That's huge to your practice because now you're going to finish patients faster, but you're still being you're still doing it in the same number of visits. You're just getting them done in and out quicker. And then we're in that immediate gratification society right now. That's super helpful to growing your practice, catching issues before they slow down treatment and helping to decrease the number of emergency visits at night and weekends. So when DM is the AI catches it or your DM coordinator catches it, you're not having to see them or getting calls after hours with a loose bracket or wire poking. Many of these are caught early. Uh, Built-in uh, patient and social media marketing opportunities or parents, especially with the before and after video, which I'm going to show you here in just a second. And then goals in general, what are they doing for you in your cases? So in your uh, leveling a line uh, and rotating early passive arch wires, goals are going to help you not to have to see them if it's not ready to change. Because many times they come in with that light wire, you still have a rotation, the tooth is moving, it's setting that. So what you're gonna do is set it at your same normal pattern, but use goals to make sure that is it really falling into those normal patterns? Are they that one third finishing faster? Are they that one third that needs to go longer? Or do they fall right in the middle and you can see them at that normal interval? And then finishing wires, how many times have you seen a patient that you're ready to deband, you're supposed to deband, you bring them in for deband, and all of a sudden they have a midline diastema? a space that you didn't notice, a tooth of the bracket popped off and rotated. So we're seeing them now with eyes on weekly or bi-weekly during that what we call check for D-band stage and making sure that we don't lose that visit that we're supposed to D-band. So this has been super helpful in keeping us on track, preventing that crying patient at D-band, and it's also helping us now with our impacted teeth, as you see it talks about down here, to make sure that we're bringing them in as soon as that arch wire is passive. We would go for long intervals and bring them in at two weeks or four weeks, we'd come in and that wire's still active. Or we go longer interval and that wire has been passive for a long time. So now using this goal for these cases is gonna keep us on track. So again, as I talked about, about a third, it's a perfect bell curve, Third faster, third longer, third in the middle. And I think that you'll probably find this as you use this more and more in your practice as well. So how about by opening using reverse curve, accentuated curve, by opening, by closing, vertical elastics. So yes, you're going to use your passive arch wire to tell you when it's not moving, but you can also now use the normal overbite. It's looking for that overbite to get to that interval. 
and you see it here of one to three millimeters. So when you're using class two elastics, along with your brackets, not with the motion, but with your brackets, you still set that canine interval or molar interval to do that. But you can also now set normal overjet. You should have closed the space. You're trying to finish this as you go through your finalizing or finishing. So you can use these goals to your advantage to follow that as well. Power change, you want to use the anterior space closure component, which you see right here. And then extractions or anterior retracting mechanics, you're going to use closure of extraction spaces that you see here. And possibly you might want to use the normal overjet. As that retracts, you may close all the space and the overjet may be stopped. You may need to bring them in and change your mechanics to bring the posterior more forward versus the, moving the anterior back. So this helps you keep on track with those cases as well. How about men lines or asymmetries? You know, class two on one side, class three on the other side. So you can set that midline um, and the transverse to help you track these types of cases. And then cross body ease or expansion, uh, say you've taken them out of the expander, you get into the light arch wire, they disappear on you, and it goes into cross body again. Well, this prevents that because we're going to be seeing it on a normal interval. And if it does start to happen, when you get back into cross body elastics, you can track that protocol. Um, through just normal arch wires, and then you can set your goals to track cross bite as well. So how can DM help you to avoid these emergency visits or prevent things from slowing down or prevent you from debonding on the day that you're supposed to? And so this is things that AI catches. If you can look at this, it says down here, bracket damage, upper right one, upper right and upper left one. If you look at this, we caught the first one because we put an O-ring on it, but we didn't catch it here. And if you notice, the door's off. So it's noticed this bracket damage that the door has been removed. It also has noticed that the O-ring is not on in this case. So what this means is this arch wire is not engaged in anything. If you had left this here, that tooth would have gone lingual again, and then it slows down your progress. How about this case? You can probably see it, and that is that this bracket has debonded. Right here, and so you see bracket debond, lower right two, and then it's also debonded on the lower right six. Can't see it from this view, but it's catching these debonds and preventing them from becoming a problem. You can already see in this case, right, that that tooth was more lingual. Left, as it continues to move, that tooth will get more lingual. We've stopped that from becoming a problem. And there's the debonded six, and all of these are tracked via AI, or sometimes, if AI can't see it, sometimes your DM coordinator will see it because we have eyes on. Eyes on help us to make sure that we keep track of this. But most of these are caught by AI. So can you spot any problems in this case? So top left, I don't see too much there. I do see something on the bottom left in this picture. And there's also something here. So what did it catch? So how about the arch wire disengagement on this lower left five? You can see the wire is actually under. It's not in the wire. You can see the open clip on the lower right four. If you look here, you see the wire is outside of the bracket, so that tooth is not going to rotate. Did anybody catch in the top right that in most cases we put bite composite on both sides? I don't know about you guys, but that's what I do. And notice that the left side is missing. And then the gingivitis or the inflamed gum tissue. It's caught that as well. Pro tip here though, is that if you've done this on purpose, this bottom left image, if you've dropped this wire for the extrusion of that tooth or eruption of that tooth, make sure you exclude it so that it doesn't keep sending you warnings or notifications. So that's an important thing to think about. How about spotting hygiene issues? If you can see in this case, you see all the plaque, even without the brackets in place on this bottom, we can see plaque and tartar here on this top left photo. You can see the tartar persisting here and the gum or gingival inflammations that are happening here on the top and the plaque that's here. And then on that bottom, if you can notice this too, what you'll see is an ulceration of the bottom left gum tissue. So that, has no, that was noticed by the AI, and this helps us keep track of this, make sure that we're staying ahead of it. And it's a CYA for you as well, because then you can send notifications saying, hey, we're noticing it. DM's going to send notifications to them, 
based off of the responses that you designed for it. So use this, use the chat tool for yourself or your, your DMC to stay ahead of this and make sure that you have the parents as guardians on these cases so that the chat also goes to them so they see this and they get these notifications as well. So how about the spotted issues here? So of course, in this case, you can see on the bottom left, this is a case that we're really trying to bring this canine into place. You can see that there's, there's plaque and, and problems here. This is what we're shooting to get to, but this is not where it went. And how do I know this? Because this is a patient that I actually I did before DM, and I wish I had DM because this is what happened. This is actually my daughter. And yes, I should be looking at my own daughter's teeth on a regular interval, but I wasn't. If I had been doing this, DM would have caught this in two ways. Number one, you can see that the arch wire broke in this case here and here because it had been turned so much and my daughter didn't say anything. And as it had been moving the tooth, the tooth had been tipping. Our eyes on would have caught this and not become a problem. So in this case, we've actually then, this was the visit we brought her back in. We haven't changed the wire. I actually am going to circumferentially tie this. The power chain was broken here to get it back into place. Had I had DM for this, it would have caught this broken wire, saved me time and effort with my own daughter. And then the before and after video. So this is a great feature. You can see it pointed to on this top left. It's not only helpful to show patients that the progress that's happening, it's great for parents. I've had many parents take a video of this and post it to their own social media and say, look at the changes that my daughter has or son has in their team. This is a great social media marketing. It's super easy for, the, for them to use. And I know in the future, we're talking about changes to this to either automatically take it and put it into social media and then also from different angles. So this is super powerful in marketing your practice and showing the progress and pulling it up right in front of the parent to say, look, look at what's happening. See how things are going and use this also a way to, to praise your patients, to give them the way to go. You're right on track. Keep going with this. So, so many different uses and ways to put, take this to your advantage. So here is your action plan going forward with, um, with DM and using goals. Set your goal intervals, follow your existing treatments. You don't have to make wholesale changes to your existing way that you schedule things. Just use dynamic scheduling to only schedule them when they're needed. And so remember, we talked about my intervals in the past. I would see them in the eight to 10 week interval. So we'd set our goal at that eight weeks. If they're done ahead of that eight weeks, we bring them in sooner, get their treatment done sooner. If they fall in the middle of that interval, great. We, we expect, told them to expect that time frame. If it's going longer, we use our chat. We use our quick responses to say, hey, we're, it looks like the wire's still working hard. Um, Let's keep this wire in a little bit longer, but you haven't brought them in and burnt a visit. So set your goal intervals based off of whatever you already do in your practice, and that way it's easier for your staff and yourself to integrate. Develop a good list of quick responses and start using automated messages. Now, this is something that we started doing anyway early on. We started using a couple of different communication tools to text with patients back and forth. We've been using Podium for a long time. We have Weave now. And in Podium, we had set up these quick responses. And now you have the quick responses set up so they go out directly to the patient and the parent, because in the past you could only send it to one person. It's going to both. So you keep them both on board and understanding where we're going with this. You keep your treatment on track. And the last thing it does is it is that permanent marker in in dm so that you can always go back and reference it to say hey we sent you this message we're trying to make sure that you stay on track or make sure that something isn't going wrong and so that way you keep treatment on track you've softened your schedule and it's a super easy quick click click for your staff member to go in and use these responses to keep the patient on track get your staff involved and, and developing and following the goals. And what I mean by this is when your staff is involved in setting things up, 
when your staff is involved in developing and helping you develop the protocols, everybody stays on board and on track. So when we do our staff meetings each time, we have our DMC, Miko, come in, and she notes the things that she's seeing. Hey, we're seeing this pattern, this pattern. By bringing them in and involving them, then they may say, well, this isn't working because, or we need to do this because. And when quick responses were able to be scheduled, that was my staff, my staff member's idea to say, hey, let's schedule the first two messages to go out to them. Using those messages, we don't have to physically communicate with them or have Miko do it. It automatically sends it out. We were doing that anyway. We were telling them, okay, two weeks, we're going to switch. Go ahead and do it. Trying to eliminate those visits, but now we can see it and know that it's going the right way. So bringing staff member and involving them in the messaging, the timing of the messaging, the auto messaging, they're going to be much more engaged in this process and in doing so, much more communicative to the parent. And now we're using those quick, quick responses to also do some marketing. Hey, we see things are going great. If you think it's going great, hey, we're going to send you a link to our Weave um, app and you can give us a review. Would you mind doing that? You can use it for a multitude of things here. Empower your DMC. And what I mean by that is train, observe, collaborate, and the burden lessens on you. And my DMC, Miko, had zero dental knowledge. She had none. And so DM offers us a super easy training tool and using messaging internally in the platform that I could train her by let, let's look at it together. And what I had her start doing is she came in and observed in the office, looking at all the things we did. Then we started looking at them in DM and I was able to train her by saying, okay, let's look at messaging. What do you see here? She would type her response. I would go in and look at it. And then we would respond back and forth. She works remotely. She's not in the office. So you can have somebody remote, train them, collaborate on these patients. We still do this now. So she will send me when there's a notification, she'll say, I think this is the problem. I think that it's ready to move on. I think it's time to see him for the next visit. And now I just go in and say, yes, next visit. No, let's do this and let's learn from this. So let's have a call later in the day to discuss this type of case. So now it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street collaborating to come to become better at not only our weekly checks with the patient, but also our in-office communication. Because Miko now, when she sees something, she'll notice it and what's going on with the patient, that we need the staff member to do this or this at the next visit, that's now entered in our software. So when we pull it up, we do that thing. One of them being, hey, they're not wearing their bands. They're not doing their scans. Let's send that message to them. Make sure that we bring a parent in and I'll say, yes, bring the parent in. Now we know when we schedule the patient, the patient doesn't just come with the nanny. The patient comes with the parent. So we're heading off problems in the future as well. If you're not if you're not already monitoring all of your brace patients and appliance cases, this is where you're going to save your time and effort. Yes, aligners. It's a no-brainer with aligners and DM. But brace cases, it's not saving you time totally in all of your cases. You're still going to have to see them to change arch wires. But what it's doing is during those visits, now we've noticed brackets loose. We've got a spacing. This tooth needs a compensating bend. This tooth needs to have a circumferential tie to rotate it because it's not working. This one needs to be disengaged and more coil spring done. So we put that note after seeing it a DM, when they come in, our treatment visits are going from, I'm about to change the interval in my office from a 30 minute visit to a 20 minute visit for our regular visits because we already know what to do. We're ahead of it. And therefore, we're going to be more efficient in doing it, even though we haven't changed the number of visits we have to see them. You still got to change the arch wire, but now we're better and faster at each of those visits. Appliances, I showed you. Motion, RPE, um, lingual arch, eruption. All of these things, you're saving time as well by monitoring these cases. We don't have to see them at all these intervals to make sure things are going right. We're already seeing it visually. 
we have our quick responses so that we, we can communicate with them and not lose track of them. We're getting our weekly house calls. Parents feel like they're communicated with more rather than less. And all dynamic scheduling, I know it's scary. I know it's one of those things to think, oh, we're gonna lose track of these. But if you've got your goal set, you're always gonna get a notification of something's going on, whether they're scanning or not. By setting your eyes on intervals and using your team, your, um, your team chat, your internal monitoring using, um, using your DMC and your staff meetings, by doing this, you're keeping track of those patients, not losing track of them, and actually keeping a closer eye on those patients that aren't doing anything, that aren't scanning, aren't wearing their elastics, aren't coming in for their normal treatment intervals. We're using it, and it's going to be a better treatment for the patient. But the dynamic scheduling frees up that time in the day. You have fewer patients in the office. And so by doing that, you're freeing up the time for the front desk to follow up with the patients that aren't coming in. You have more time for your staff members. If we know that we saw Johnny last week and he wasn't wearing his bands or his hygiene was bad, then your staff member can go in there and type a quick response and say, hey, just following up, how's Johnny doing? On our recall visits, which we didn't even really get to in this, we actually can send a message and many times our recalls were following habits like thumb habits or pacifier habits in younger kids, finger habits, tongue thrust. And we can send a message that says, hey, how's it going? Hey, have you been seeing the speech pathologist? Hey, you might want to consider going and seeing a myofunctional therapist. And that way we can keep them on track, even when it comes to not braces with not just appliances, all cases. And again, we always think about DM and aligners, but it's so much more versatile, especially with this dynamic scheduling. And the last thing it does for you is you can take advantage of the reduced scheduling, reduced time to do more things like marketing. You can have more frequent staff visits. You can have more frequent staff meetings if you want to. And so it's free things up. My staff has taken the extra time. They asked me for a cricket. They want to be more involved in the marketing. They said, hey, we want to start going to more offices and direct marketing to them. And so we set up our bonus system based off of that. So now... If they go out and we increase our new patients, if we increase our new patient referrals, they get more um, from the bonus system. And so they have more time to do that, to engage the patient, engage the marketing in marketing, or even engage local schools. So they're the ones that want to do that. And it's just saving us time and effort overall. So I just want to tell you, you guys have got this. Um, you can do this. You can go to dynamic scheduling right away not have any problems in doing so. You got to get your team all on board and not all are going to be that way, but that's okay because you do, you've probably done this already with some sort of appliance in your, in your practice that no one wanted to use and now you're doing it. For us in the past, we had 3D printing. We went all in with 3D printing, got rid of all alginate in the office, got rid of all the trimming of models in the office. And my office manager was the person that said, no, we, we shouldn't do that. We don't need to do that. But after came to me and said, you were right. It's freed things up. Same thing here will happen. And my staff members within a month and a half of starting DM were like, we don't want to give it up. We're not going to give it up because we've seen what it does to our practice. And now over a year in going full all in dynamic scheduling, it's better, easier each day. We've decreased the number of patients by a significant number. So uh, with that, I'll open up to... Um, the questions. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Reagan. Um, there's some, there are some questions, but before I get to those, I'd like again to invite viewers to use the question and answer feature in your control panel on your screen to ask any questions that you have. Um, first question, what made you decide to implement dental monitoring to begin with? Well, I talked a little bit about it at the beginning, which was going all in at the, after the, um, the uh, dental monitoring uh, uh, symposium, but what really did it to me was my staffing issues that I was having. That was the number one thing that I noticed is that, I, and, and for a long time, I thought I needed more staff and it was already trouble hiring staff. What it turns out is I didn't need to hire extra. I needed to just be better and more efficient with what I'm doing. And so what I found was after starting DM, we were before 
we were busy, but not productive. And what I mean by that is we were seeing 60 patients a day and about 20 to 40% of them on a daily basis were those patients that didn't need to be seen that often. And now with DM, we're not seeing them that often. So that's just freed things up with less staff members. And again, when I did hire Miko to, my, to be my DM coordinator, I didn't have to look for somebody that already had the experience. I could take somebody like her and train her to do it. She's a great people person. She loves being on top of things, very organized. So you can take a person like that who has no dental training, make them a great communicator in your practice directly through DM. And so that was the trigger was the staffing and being more productive and not just busy. Okay, how did you pre present the concept of remote monitoring to your team? What was their reaction? Um, I'm an early adopter of a lot of things. And so I kind of expect a little bit of that wailing and gnashing of teeth uh, in, in the practice when you put anything new in. And so they were hesitant, very hesitant to go all in. And the front desk people were very hesitant not to schedule somebody when they walk out. How are we going to keep track of them? How are we going to make sure that none of the thing is getting, that this isn't getting out of hand? And so what I went to them after listening to all these speakers at, at the summit was, what if we could save 20 to 50% on a daily basis, the number of patients that are seen in the office that don't need to be seen in the office? What if we could see 30 or 40 patients versus 60 to 65 patients? And as soon as I said that to them, they say, yeah, that's great, but is it gonna happen? And I told you a month and a half in, we could see the change in the schedule because you're not seeing all these patients on a regular basis. You're seeing them with virtual house calls via DM on a weekly basis. So those patients that came in were much fewer. The ones that were coming in, we already had notes and made them better. So by doing that, the staff was all in very quickly. And that wailing and gnashing that happened when I talked about with the 3D printing, which took months and months for it to see it happen, happened super quick. But it's going all in. You have to do it from the very beginning. And in doing so, and not just with the liner cases, going all in with your brace cases, your appliance cases are going to get you there better and faster. And your staff will really understand and get on board so much quicker as well. Okay, um, our practices averages 100 patients per day, four days a week. My team is excited about reducing that to 50 to 60 patients with dental monitoring, but we're worried that it will mean reduced hours and income. Do you have any, did you have any similar feedback from your team early on? Definitely, yeah, they, they were worried, especially when you talk about a bonus system, right? Because they tie, they tie bonuses many times, not to just the fact that we talk about new patients starts, new patient referrals. That's what we're really, that's what we're really bonusing on. But they thought that by seeing patients less, that means fewer people in the office and therefore they're not going to get their bonus and we're not going to be as productive or efficient. It's completely the opposite because um, what you're doing is you are freeing up that time. I talked to you about how my staff really wanted to get into the marketing side themselves so they could get the bonus. And by doing that, fewer patients means more time to do other things. Make sure we're ordering, keep our ordering so we don't get behind in ordering. We don't have someone coming and we don't have something. They're, they're ready on these days that we don't have as many patients or we're lighter. Hey, we can send a couple of people out to go direct market to those individual offices or new offices that we're hoping to get them to send us new patients. So really, I know the fear is there that it's gonna cause a problem, but what really ends up happening is your staff is happier your staff is more engaged because they have more time. They don't feel like they're just constantly on the run, not getting stuff done. And so even with fewer, fewer staff members, we got the same amount done seeing fewer patients. So it was a no brainer. What was the biggest challenge for you personally during the implementation process? And what about the team? Yeah, so for me, it was uh, some of the early integration. And, and what I mean by that is not necessarily the integration in having patients get into it, but it was the integration in making sure that I had all my ducks in a row. So setting up all the protocols, 
all the responses that go along with it and uh, making sure that, you know, things like I talked about the um, unseating, how much unseating do I want before it sends me a message? But luckily what DM offers is their, um, the staff members that they have on board and developing some of these protocols, they've done it already with all of these different types of cases. And, and including mine, because we had to kind of, in, we had, kind of had to invent some protocols or rechange some protocols. And we talked about motion appliance. So now that's all there and settled. You've got so many team members with DM that are there to help, to integrate that, to help you figure out what's the best interval for that unseating. Um, what protocols should we set up when we get started with a brace case, with an aligner case, with a, um, with an appliance case. So all that is set up now. So that's a, that's a much lesser of a burden on the new integrating uh, staff member, or sorry, new integrating office as you go along. Now for the staff, they had two main fears. And that was number one, the fear of the schedule changing and dynamic scheduling and not seeing someone back. And number two, they thought it was gonna be hard to train patients to scan, or it was gonna take so much more time to train patients to scan. Because we had been an early adopter with the cheek retractors that were really hard to work with, but now with the current um, scanning protocols and the current scan box, it's so easy to do that it has not become a problem. The one thing we did add is a scanning station. And what I mean by that is we have a, a spot where we have a mirror, a table, and um, all of the little tubes and tube sizes right next to it so that we can go set their phone down, show them how to set it up, help them to scan. And so training somebody to scan, which was hard at the beginning, became so much easier because we've integrated all this. And, and now the DM team has all of that. Some of the suggestions came from Holly, who I, um, I said thanks to earlier. She told me, hey, you need a place to have everybody go and scan. Runnels taught, said you need a table next to it. So now we've learned all that. You're hearing it in this in this webinar that you can do that too. So having a dedicated place for them to do their scans that was an easy thing that stopped that fear of the staff. How did you optimize workflows with dental monitoring? So workflows um, were set up already, but they were workflows to bring them into the office. So what you're doing in optimizing them is actually just changing them from your workflow on, okay, we see them eight to 10 weeks for each uh, for each uh, initial wire. You see them on a six to eight week basis for each of your appliances. What you've done now is you put them into the protocols. And so those protocols already have it set at that interval. So now it's all set up. So once you set the protocol, it's going. So it actually helps you keep track of those um, protocols and you don't really need to optimize them after you've set it up from the beginning. Now, you may tweak them as you go along because you may say, oh, well, I was seeing people at 10 weeks, but a lot of people are finishing early. Let's change it to an eight week interval. Well, let's change it to a six week interval. So as we have gone through with our goals, it actually is changing and optimizing in a different way by saying, okay, we really don't need as much time for this. Many patients are doing faster with motion on these types of cases, phase ones, for example. We see our phase one patients because they're so good at wearing their elastics, finish their bike correct and pike correction sooner than I expected. So we, we might change that goal interval from that three months to two and a half or two months. And that way we just stay on track a little bit more efficiently with those phase ones. So it's, it's helped us in, we've optimized it, but we've optimized it through our goals. How did switching to dynamic scheduling impact your practice operations and your personal life too? So I kind of hit on this uh, earlier in the fact that it's it's dynamic scheduling is really not about the scheduling. I think that's 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 what it actually does for you is you don't schedule until it's needed. But what it is really doing is we're not scheduling a person until their own biology says it's time to change. And so we're moving away from all the research norms that say, okay, it should be in this time frame or this time frame, right? It's actually taking each individual person 
and making them an individual. And so we, we use biology to get us to that right place. And so what it has done overall, the dynamic scheduling is said, okay, we've, we've softened our, our schedule. We've used the, the uh, biology of the patient to get to the right place. So we're truly taking each person, making them an individual, only see them as we need to. And when we do see them, the purposefulness of our visits, the timing of our visits, because every mom is ready to get in and out as quickly as possible, right? They've got to go take the next kid to something. They've got their own tennis match. They've got a next kid has a performance at school they got to get to. So we're actually becoming a much better, more efficient office and dynamic scheduling is the key to that. I know it's scary. I know it's like, oh, how are we going to keep up with all this? But all of the things that DM has in place helps you to keep up with that. And then using your own ion intervals with your DM coordinator also does that. So dynamic scheduling has been a game changer for our office. How has how much time has dental monitoring saved your practice in terms of paperwork and in-office visits? Yeah, so uh, I, like I said earlier, I think it's 20 to 50 percent in the number of patients on a daily basis. So you can imagine how much time that that is spending is uh, helping you. Paperwork. Now we don't need to generate all those little slips of paper that we send out to the patients um, uh, with each visit like we used to, like on um, our motion patients. We had that. Okay. You should be in this one and then this one and this one. So that's all in quick replies. And each person gets it in an interval as opposed to giving it at the beginning that they may throw away or put it to the side. It's there ready to go. And I kind of missed on this a little bit earlier. And that is, how is it, how is it lessened for me? Well, my stress has decreased because it, my daughter, the one I told you that's, that's playing college lacrosse um, in, in field hockey, we went to see her play once a month and I took an extra day off once a month that I never did in the past. But I knew that when I left that I could still see my patients. If they had a problem in the office, they could send me or say, hey, look at the DM scan for this patient. They came with a broken bracket. What do you think? I would quickly look. I can look at it not only on the computer, but I can also look at on my phone. And you can use your phone to review cases and look at it and say, oh yeah, I'm sitting here at the game. They've got an emergency. That should be fine. Go ahead and do this or this. So it's freed me up to feel like I can still be out of the office and be productive and still be out of the office. But my staff can communicate with me very easily saying, hey, take a look at the scan and free things up that way. I only use dental monitoring for new aligner and braces patients. If I move some of my existing patients into monitoring, will that create more disruption than it would solve? I, I struggle with that early on, trying to figure that out. And and yes, it's a no-brainer immediately to go all in with your patients that are starts. Easy. Braces, aligners, um, appliances, all of those. What we decided to do with our patients is the ones that were within their last six months of treatment, we did not convert them to DM. We offered it to them but we didn't make it a big push to convert them. Anybody that was six months or more, we just told them we were gonna go to convert them. And we told them the benefits as we're doing it. Hey, so we're starting this protocol with you. What it's gonna do is this, it's going to save you visits. It's going to avoid emergency visits from becoming a problem on the weekend. Wouldn't you rather not have to miss a game or something on the weekend because we can fix it before it becomes a problem. And and so by doing those things, it actually put those patients at ease and they were ready to do it. If they were within their last six months and they wanted to do it, I told them, hey, it's going to help you this, this and this. But we didn't push the point. We just offered it. They said, no, nah, we're close enough to the end. We're not going to do it. Fine. So that was kind of our dividing factor. Six months less. We suggested it, but we didn't push them. Everybody beyond that, we said, we're going to do it because we know the benefits are going to save us in the long term. What benefits do the patients and parents report uh, using dental monitoring? Yeah, well, it's been it's been really cool. I mean, that that um, before and after video. I mean, some of the parents are just absolutely blown away, and many parents were treated with things like headgears and 
those goo impressions had to stay in there for so long. And so when we show them this technology, we show them what it can do for them. Most of the parents are like, oh my gosh, I am all in. Let's do it. Let's go for it. But what I was surprised with is even some of the parents are like, oh, I don't want to have to make them scan and oh, I don't have to make them do this. We start to des describe the benefits to them. They start to scan and then they see it themselves. One of the biggest, I think, is hygiene. And that's the hardest to track from a distance, right? You don't see them from the moment that they're in the office to eight to 10 weeks. What if their hygiene is terrible? I've seen people develop decalcification or develop pitting on a place that was already decaled within an eight or 10 week interval for kids who are not so good brushers. So now we're tracking hygiene from the very moment that we start seeing them and avoid it from becoming a decalcification spot or, or a permanent tooth scar. And now with my pediatric friends, there's actually some new technology out there that if you catch these white spots and white lesions that are in their early stages, you can place this material on there. And believe it or not, and I was blown away that this new material will lay down new enamel matrix and regrow some of the lost enamel. But you can't do that if it's too far along, if it's already cavitated, if it's already a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're actually now using this, the hygiene part. If we start to see the white lesions, we are going to send them to the pediatric dentist or their general dentist, ask them if they have this, and prevent those from becoming an even bigger problem. So the parents are starting to see that we are staying ahead and on track and ahead of the problems. And most parents that are doing it on their second or third child, they're like, I can't wait. This can be great because they know it's going to save them compared to what a first child who never did it was like. Our patients are responding very favorably to dental monitoring and the less office visits, but we still struggle to convey the bigger picture value to our patients. Any advice for explaining it? So state that again. I'm sorry. Our patients are responding very favorably to dental monitoring and our less office visits, but we still struggle to convey to convey the bigger picture value to patients. Any advice on how to explain it? Yeah, so what, what you need to do is, is you don't talk about it being as much about a weekly scan. You talk it about it being weekly house calls, right? So by, by doing that, it adds value. You're adding value to the fact that we're going to be monitoring you more frequently. And we talk about these three layers. Layer one is AI. So they already know about AI. They keep hearing about it, right? And so... It's adding that value to something that actually affects their own kids. And if we say, hey, AI is going to be tracking stuff, but we also have Miko. She sits behind the scenes remotely looking at every case. And then you've got Dr. Reagan and staff. And so now they see that each of these things are helpful to them. And so it's got this complete added value component, not just on um, the finished product, but during the process. And so what we're doing is we're staying ahead, staying on time, being more efficient, and therefore being a better overall practitioner. I do believe that over, over time, as AI gets better and we get better, we are going to be better practitioners. We're going to see things before they become a problem. We're going to head off things looking at it the same way that everybody else looks at it. What I mean by that is every photo taken in DM is the same way that you would see them if you're taking a photo of them, if you're looking at them, talking to them in a conversation. And in doing so, I've even changed the way that I do my adjustments at the end, not only based off of what I see at the chair side, but what I see in DM. So we're gonna be overall a better practice, a better um, provider of treatment, and in the, long in the long term, faster and more efficient at doing it, and therefore more profitable. Um, what are the problems or trends um, may, that has dental monitoring's detection capability identified that may have been missed without the AI software? Well, I think I think the biggest is, and we talked about it already, is the hygiene. But but the other components are, I mean, even some of these pictures that you see in DM, when they tell me there's a loose or broken bracket, I still don't see it sometimes, and so. What AI has done 
has found things by using those predictable patterns to track things, it's actually keeping ahead of the problems. I, I think that's one of its um, most valuable components. And that is by staying ahead of the problems, catching them before they become a bigger issue, it's better for everybody. It's better for the patient because we stay on time and on track. It prevents infection, like I showed you with that RPE. And so noticing those gingival inflammations, even before they become big and bad, is super helpful. Avoiding the hygiene issues, like I said, with these using the pediatric dentist and this new technology. And as technology continues to get better, we may find things that, okay, with the new motion appliance, the Motion Pro, it may be better with this or this, and we need to see them quicker. We have a drop-in hook with the new Motion Pro, and that, that drop-in hook needs to be monitored more closely. So now we're able to use the AI to track and make sure, is that hook still intact? Is the power chain still connected? So we're not losing what we were doing before. So AI is a super powerful tool, not only for tracking progress, but preventing things from becoming an issue and helping us stay on track. Any advice you could share that may be helpful for a new remote monitoring user and their team? Yes, go all in. I mean, that's the number one thing. And, and it, it seems like it's a lot all at once. And, and it is. But anything that's new and innovative is going to be that way. When you first switch to your newest iPhone, even though you know the main functionality, if you don't spend time doing it, you're not going to get to know it and use it. So by going all in from the very beginning, and all in, I mean every patient that you start, all the patients within a certain interval that you determine, and then all in with dynamic scheduling. you got to do that from the very beginning, and in doing that, you are going to see the benefits faster. You're going to free up your time and your schedule so much faster. You're going to get your staff on board uh, much faster and much more efficiently. And also, you'll start to see that lessening, that dropping of the shoulders on a daily basis. You don't come in every day worried that one little emergency is going to drag the rest of your, your time down because you're, you're free to handle those. You're free to stand and talk to a parent. I love the parent interaction on a daily day-to-day day -day basis. I love hearing about the kids and what they do. Now, I don't worry about standing there and talking a little extra time because I've got more time in my schedule to do it. So going all in from the very beginning with every patient, with dynamic scheduling, with doing it not just on aligners but everything else is going to save you, free things up, and be a much more efficient, better practice. I truly, truly believe that. Hey, and our last question, what advice would you give to doctors who may be on the fence about remote monitoring and who are hesitant to make the plunge in transforming their existing practices? So I think sometimes the we as orthodontists, dentists, anybody who owns their own practice, their own business, right? We, we we look at things from a monetary frugal perspective. And and sometimes the look at, at DM is like, well, it's just gonna cost more per patient. I mean, I, I I'm already charging this, I gotta charge them more. It's it's a complete wrong thinking. And what I mean by that is I've already told you how many visits it's going to save you. Do you, do you know that there's been multiple studies and almost every study shows that your cost per visit, your cost per chair visit runs you just to sterilize a chair for a patient that stays for one minute, somewhere between $130 and $240 per patient per visit. So what if you eliminate three to eight visits in your practice? You're more profitable, you're more efficient, and, and so why not do it? It's worth the value. And, and so value to, to um, the, the monetary value to worth in your practice, huge. And the other thing is it will change your every day. If you are not on something that's helping you to make you be more efficient, see patients on a less regular basis, you're doing it wrong. And DM is that that way of doing it. it's that platform it provides all of those things for you and yes you're still going to have some of those patients who don't scan who won't wear their elastics who don't come to their visits that's never going to change but we're going to have the majority of your patients in and so the ones who aren't doing that you do have more time in that day to see them so the value the worth 100 you should do it. it it should not be one of those oh i don't have enough staff 
oh, I think it's going to cost too much money. No, go and do it. Go all in. You will you will not regret doing it. it. It has changed everything. And again, I told you, my staff are the ones saying now we don't want to get rid of it. We don't want to stop doing it. And 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 it really is a value add, not a not a um, drain on overhead. It's a value add in your practice. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reagan, and thank you everyone for your questions, but we've run out of time today. And if we did not get to your question, we will answer it after the webinar via email. Be sure to take the free CE quiz associated with, with this webinar to receive credit. Shortly, we will email you the recording of this presentation and instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Thank you all again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Mike Reagan for a great presentation and our sponsor for this webinar, Dental Monitoring. Thanks.